on this message tonight, how to survive the presidential election. So I just plan on equally offending everybody over the next 30 minutes. <laughs> oh man, what a topic, what a subject, what a, what a year that we're walking through. Um, there's a lot of negative about 2020, but I am thankful to be alive. Uh, I, I believe we're here on purpose. I believe it's a reason that God placed you here in 2020. I, I don't know if you ever, uh, if you played sports growing up, but you think about the first string, you save the first string for whenever the battle is difficult, whenever there's a lot going on. And I just, you know, you, you, Michael, Michael Jordan, I'm showing how I grew up, watching Michael Jordan, the GOAT. We, Michael Jordan is not sitting the bench in the fourth quarter when the game is on, right? He is in the game. Why? Because uh, he, he's first string. And I just wanted to say it's a reason that you are in the kingdom for such a time as this. It's not so that you can be defeated. It's so that you can have the victory in Jesus Christ and have hope. So there's a reason that you are here. Uh, God could have placed us in at any time in human history, but he put us in 2020 on purpose. And I believe it's our finest hour. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about a subject that um, either one of two things, either people don't want to hear their pastor talk about it all, or uh, they, they really want to hear this talked about all the time. And uh, I think there are times where we need to address uh, political issues um, from a biblical standpoint and from a kingdom mindset. And that's just not something we're seeing in the news. It's not something we're seeing uh, much in the world today. Um, there's no subject that's been as divisive as politics. Can I get a witness for that, right? I could post 50 encouraging words online, and then one thing I post that has any political tinge to it, people come out of the woodwork, um, and that's all of us. Uh, Christians are divided. Um, division in the church uh, is not something new. It's something that's happened for thousands of years, but it's really new in this arena over the past couple hundred years. Most of the times, people would divide over doctrinal issues, uh, but this is, uh, we have the privilege of being in a democracy where we have the opportunity to vote. The early Christians didn't have that opportunity. They were just told who their emperor was. Um, and I think it's a reason, this reason, John 17, one of Jesus' last prayers is that we would be one. Um, because I think there's a temptation for us to be divided and for us to uh, divide over all types of issues. And I just pray tonight God does a work in our hearts. And, and, and I would ask a couple things. Open up your hearts. Um, to God's word tonight. I want to want to say a few things. Number one, I'm not going to say everything right tonight, okay? Number two, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. So if that's why you are watching, like, what's Pastor Brandon going to talk about tonight? I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say everything right. I promise you that. There's so much, um, there's so much around all of these topics that you may have to actively focus on not being offended tonight. See, offense is hard because offense, we put up walls when we get offended and we refuse to hear. Um, and that's okay from time to time with, with people. Uh, we got to watch our hearts to not be offended. Um, it leads to a lot of difficult and negative things in the scripture. And God says that we got to watch it's the bait of Satan in our lives, but it's so important that we don't allow what's happening on the outside of the world to affect what's happening on the inside of the church. So we open up our hearts to God's word tonight. First Corinthians chapter one and verse 10. I want to start there with our text tonight. And uh, Paul writes this. He says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. And stop right there and just say amen to that word. This is the heart of Christ and his church. And think about how divided our world is. God calls for a united church. He says, goes on to say, rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels. And we're about to see what they're fighting about. It says, my brothers and sisters, some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos. Some are saying, I'm with President Trump. Others are saying, I'm with Joe Biden. Wait, I didn't see it. I guess it's right there, yeah. 
I'm a follower of Peter. And some say, oh, or I only follow Christ. In other words, it was personality-driven division happening in the church. People were saying, well, I'm aligning my life with this leader, and this is who I follow. We align ourselves with this. We align ourselves with political candidates. We align ourselves with media outlets. You know, I'm a, I'm a CNN type of person, or I'm a Fox News type of person, or I'm, a, I'm an independent podcast kind of person. We, we align ourselves with these people and with these leaders in our society. We all do it. Paul says it's important that you don't let division come in because you're following some leader. Verse 13, he asks the question. He says, has Christ been divided into factions? In other words, you're the body of Christ. I got a question. Are you divided? Has Christ been divided? He said you're allowing the outside world and what people say to divide you, but Christ isn't divided, and you're the body of Christ. He says, was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? And he just answers this question, of course not. And so I, I want to title this message again tonight, How to Survive the Presidential Election, or if I had a subtitle for this, I would say this, A Divided World Needs a United Church. We live in a unique time in human history. Never has there been a democratic society quite like America. We are pioneers. Uh, every man and woman in our society today has a responsibility and opportunity uh, to vote. The early churches, I said earlier, they were just given a king or an emperor. Um, that voting was not a strife, a sense of strife in them at all um, because they were just told who, who to vote for and they had a whole different set of things that they were they were fighting for, and it says, and, and he, here we are today, we, we have a stewardship to vote. I'm so thankful for the opportunity. I'm so thankful to be an American. I'm thankful, uh, even in the midst of all that's happening, I'm thankful that, that, that to, be a, to be a citizen of the United States of America, God's blessed us. I'm so thankful for the freedom to worship here. I'm so thankful for all the blessings that we have, and I, I'm thankful to have the opportunity to vote. I have stewardship in our nation, one in a, I don't know, 350 millionth stewardship. And, uh, and how we vote. And uh, if we don't watch it, earthly politics will divide God's church. I feel like I'm seeing it day after day just from a, as a pastor. I feel like people are going all in in the middle of this election and they're putting all their relationships on the line. They're putting their friendships on the line with, and, and, and they're going all in. They're, they're losing lifelong friendships over this election over this season that we're walking through and they're pushing all of the chips to the center of the table and saying, this is it for me. And the dangerous thing is in just a few weeks, there's gonna be a winner and there's gonna be a loser. And there are gonna be people that are going to divide themselves for a lifetime from people who are saved, who are going to go to heaven with them because we're putting too much I believe, into what's happening right now. And I want to challenge us all as the body of Christ to think about what we're walking through from a higher perspective. Think about if you were going on a mission trip to another country that was politically divided. That happened to me um, one of my first mission trips. I went to a nation in South America and they were having a civil war at the time. There was a lot of political discourse happening back and forth and I didn't lose any sleep over it at all. As a matter of fact, I was just glad to be there. When I got up to preach, I wasn't focused on what was happening in their political arena. I was focused on what Jesus was doing there. And we were seeing God do miracles. We saw the blind eyes open. We saw deaf ears be unstopped. We saw God do miracles, but they were so divided. But I did not get upset about it. I was so focused on what my mission was. Why? Because I was not invested there. I was from another nation. And so I came in with a different purpose. Church, I wanna tell you, we're from a different nation. We have a different purpose. And we should not be getting all out of sorts over what's happening in this nation. Can I tell you, as an American citizen of Earth, a citizen of Earth, an American citizen, we'll have many presidents. But as a citizen of heaven, an eternal citizen of heaven, we'll have but one king, and his name is Jesus. We didn't vote him in. We can't vote him out. He reigns supreme. We got to think about what we're walking through from another perspective. And I've just made the decision. I'm not going to attach my joy, my peace, my sleep, 
Come on, somebody. Thank God. I've heard so many people. I'm just losing sleep over what I see online. If I could encourage you tonight, we're, this is an earthly election in this kingdom. This world is not our home. Amen. I'm not going to allow my love for you or anybody in this room or anybody watching online. I'm not going to allow my love for you as the body of Christ to be torn apart because of an earthly election. This is not going to change my relationship with any of you. And if I can encourage you, don't let what happens in this world to change what happens between brothers and sisters in Christ. See, if Satan can divide us, he can destroy us. We need to vote from a kingdom worldview instead of a dogmatic two-party win-or-lose earthly worldview. The world says you got two choices. This is what it is. You got to align yourself with this person of earth. You got to say, I'm with Paul. I'm with Apollos. I'm with this person. I'm with that person. And that's got to be who you are. And Paul says to the church, is Christ divided? Are you following people or are you following God? And so I want to challenge us to think a little bit differently and get some new lenses for what the, is going to happen in the election. There's all kinds of things happening in the election. Tonight there's a debate after this service is over. And there will be a lot of different things that happen over the next few weeks in our nation. I promise you that. And then it will be more things, there will be more things that happen after those few weeks. And I really felt like it was important for us as the body of Christ, for, for, for me as a pastor of this church, to stand up in front of the people I love and to say, guys, we have to see this from a kingdom perspective and we have to realize God put us in 2020, not just for an election, but so that the kingdom of God would move forward, that we would point people to the one that we just got done singing about, Jesus. And so here's some lenses. If you're taking notes, I'd love for you to take notes tonight. Uh, number one, we have to look at Christ. If we're going to look and decide how to survive this, how to not go crazy, how not to have all the anxiety and all the fear, we have to look at Jesus. We have to look at Christ. Paul says you've got to be united in one mind. Well, what mind is that? That's the mind of Christ. That we need to not all be going from our own perspective. We need to be looking either we're Christians or we're not. Christian is not just a word or just a, 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 a section of a bookstore in town. No, Christian means you're following after Jesus Christ or else you're not a Christian. That's what we're called to be. So how was Jesus political? There's all kinds of people saying what Jesus would do right now in the world. And it, it bugs the dog out of me, if I could just be honest. I, because I'll say this. Jesus was constantly... Well, people tried to constantly pull him into a debate or into hate, constantly. Constantly, the world around Jesus was trying to pull him to get on some side on our earthly kingdom. I'll show it to you. One time, uh, people were trying to get Jesus on paying taxes to Caesar, and he, they showed him a coin and said, should we pay taxes? And you're talking about this kingdom of God. Should we pay taxes? And he, Jesus says, I'm not going to let you take the message off the kingdom, here's, here's what you need to do. He says this, genius, give, he, he asks the question, whose image is on the coin? Oh, that's powerful. He says, Caesar's image is on the coin. He said, awesome. Well, you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but you give to God what belongs to God. In other words, Caesar's image is on the coin, but God's image is on your life. Make sure you don't miss that this is not about the kingdom of this world. This is about the kingdom of God in our lives. Genius. Amazing. One time they tried to make Jesus king. He refused. He wasn't. That's not why he came. Jesus was not going along with the systems of the day because he was obsessed with another kingdom, his kingdom. In, G in our day, we have a two-sided system. I found this so fascinating when I was studying this. In, in our day, we have a two-sided system predominantly. Democrats and Republicans. Jesus' day, there were at least four that I could uh, that I could find that were very prominent in Jesus' day. You had the Pharisees, which were a class that they were all about keeping the law. 
They were all about the law. They were all about the Jewish law and being very conservative with, with that. Then you had the Sadducees, which were uh, rich aristocrats. Uh, they represented the kind of fame, the high priesthood. Um, they had um, favor with Rome. They had adopted a lot of Greek um, Hellenistic language and stories and knowledge. They were very uh, kind of aristocratic people, the Sadducees. And then you had the Essenes, which uh, John the Baptist was one of these. They separated themselves and many lived isolated uh, in communal living. And they were kind of uh, the libertarian bunch of, you know, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. That's of their day. And um, the, then you had zealots. Uh, and the zealots would start riots and insurrections because, mind you, in Jesus' day, the Jewish people were under the, were, were under the rule of, of, of Rome. And so there was this constant push of insurrection. And this was not just in the culture. This was actually among Jesus' own disciples. He, had, he attracted such a diverse group of people um, that he had zealots in his own camp. And uh, one time <laughs> they came to him and they said, hey, should we call fire? They said, we're seeing you do all this miracle stuff. Can we take some of that miracle stuff and call fire down from heaven on this Samaritan village? <laughs> And Jesus says, you don't know what spirit you're of. And uh, Jesus had a tax collector on his team. Jesus was bigger than all of the people's political passions of the day. And I came to tell you and us as a church, church, let's fly higher than anything of this world. Let's fly higher than Republican. Let's fly higher than Democrat. Let's fly higher than Libertarian, Independent, or whatever word you could put on who you are. Let's fly the kingdom of God. Let's be about what Jesus was about, the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 1, the Holy Spirit's about to be poured out on the day of Pentecost. And, and again, the zealot, zealots kind of come back to Jesus and ask, okay, is this the time when we're going to conquer the Romans? And they're ready to go fight. And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. That's for the Father. And then he tells them, you go and you preach the gospel. You go and you make a difference. You go and you share the gospel in, in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. What was he saying? He was constantly challenging his followers to just get out of the political arena alone and realize it's about the kingdom of God. It's bigger than what we think it is. Are you thoroughly offended yet? Here we go. Let's, let's keep moving forward. Number two, look at the early church. So look at Jesus, look at the early church. The early church was under terrible authoritarian leadership. Um, their leader at the time, their emperor was um, Nero, which regardless of what you think about our current leadership, whether it's in our city, our state, or in our nation, our leaders have no comparison with the leadership that the early church experienced in their day. Nero literally fed them to lions for sport, would hang them up. You study it for yourself. They would hang them up, light them on fire, and would use the bodies of burning Christians as the street lamps for the city of Rome. But what did the early church have to say about Nero? You never find them mentioning him in the scripture. You don't find them, if it was me, in that early church, I think I would have wrote a whole letter, put a whole book of the Bible called Nero. Hashtag, I hate Nero. Chapter two, verse four, you know, I mean, just write it down. But you don't see them saying that at all. What did they do? They honored Nero. The epistles many times say, pray for the king, honor the king. Honor is a lost value in our day. It's sad, very sad. Honor is not about agreement or honor is not even about respect. Honor is the decision to trust God's authority in placing leaders in the world. Honor is a choice to respect the position, not the person. They honored Nero. Well, how hard would that be when someone's literally killing your family and you're honoring this leader? Here's, what about this one? They prayed for Nero, prayed for him. They, they prayed for the one that was hurting them. They didn't just pray for him to die. <laughs> they, they, they prayed for, 
for the Lord to bless, for the Lord to help. And I, I feel this. I, I've, I've prayed since City Hills has been here. We, we've, had, we've had two presidents, President Obama and uh, President Trump. And both situations, anytime I say we're going to pray for the president, I can feel it in the room. Whether it's a Democrat or Republican, whoever does not like who's in power, you can feel, we're doing what? Felt it Sunday. Praying for who? The president? Church, this is our call. This is who we are. And I will pray for whoever God places in leadership in our nation, and I believe you should too. We pray. We honor and this is something else they did. They refused to worship Nero. Caesar worship was big in that day. It was the God they were supposed to worship. Even though they honored, even though they prayed, they refused to worship their earthly leader. There was a big statue in the middle of Rome, and then everywhere where Roman rule was, they would put these statues of Caesar, and they were supposed to kiss the statue of Caesar to worship Caesar. But Christians, the reason why they were getting persecuted was because even though they honored, even though they prayed, they refused to worship the leader. Church, can I encourage you tonight, refuse to worship any earthly leader. No earthly leader should ever get your allegiance so deeply that you worship them, put your hope in them, put your joy in them, put your adoration in them, feel like they're the person that's going to fix every problem in the world. There's only one king, and his name is Jesus. There's What's happening in our world? Both sides. You're the answer. You're the answer. There's only one answer, and it's, and it's Jesus. Vote. Be active, but refuse to worship anybody but Jesus Christ alone. There were five traits in the early church that they were most known for. This was because they didn't have the political fights. Here are the things that the church fought for, if you will, in the middle of their culture. This was so powerful, I believe, whenever I was studying this. Number one, they fought for diversity. The church was known for diversity. The church was multicultural. The early church was multi-ethnic. The early church was multi-class. There were Greeks and Jews and Romans and all of these people together, all at the foot of the cross. Uh, there was men and there was women and there was all, like it was, it was this group of diverse people all together. Nobody separated into classes, but this is the place where everybody belongs and everybody has value and everybody is created in the image of God. That was the early church. Uh, another trait of the early church was compassion. They had compassion for the poor. They had compassion for the sick. They had compassion for the alien or for what we would call today the immigrant, for the person that was in the country but wasn't from there. The early church had a heart of compassion for people. Number three, the early church was defined by their forgiveness. Not only their forgiveness of each other, but their forgiveness of the world around them and the leaders around them. People, they would literally be dying for their faith and they would be standing there forgiving them. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus was the leader in this and showed the church how to forgive and the early church was defined not by hate and anger and pointing fingers at the world around them, but they were defined by this forgiveness of the world around them that was so countercultural. Uh, number four, the early church was known for adoption and uh, love for the for children or for the unborn. Uh, the the church was champions for kids not to be killed. There were um, there were not abortions like we have in this day in that day necessarily. It wasn't as technologically um, advanced in all the things like we do today. But what would happen in that day was much the same. There would be babies born but unwanted and. They would literally be taken outside the city gate and thrown in the ditch. Christians would go to the children who were unwanted, who their parents tried to kill, and would pick them up and would adopt them into their families and would raise them as part of their family. This was a defining aspect of the, of the, of the early church in the kingdom of God. 
Christians would raise them as their own sons and daughters. Christians were just different. When other people didn't see value in, in, in these kids, Christians would, would say, no, they're so valuable. Um, another defining trait is that the early church was sexually countercultural. I don't know how else to say it. But in Rome, anything went sexually. They literally had temples that were, that were you worship your false god through prostitution and through just all kinds of uh, crazy things. And it was just whatever says goes. And the church was very different. The church stood for a set of values that was from the scripture that was very different than the world around them. You know, marriage between a, a man and a woman and the, the marriage bed being undefiled and stood for integrity and, and, and fidelity and all of these things that was very, very different than the world around. And I, I wanted to show you all of those five things to show you this. This was fascinating to me. There are two political parties, and this is um, this may be a, a point where you disagree, regardless of kind of where your, your natural leaning is in what I'm about to say. But our two parties have taken these values, and they each kind of had defined themselves over I, I, what I saw is two of them, um, that when it comes to the Democratic Party today, they would say, uh, that they are defined by diversity of race and ethnicities and inclusion of uh, racial issues and these type of things are uh, also that they stand for compassion, caring for the poor, caring for the sick, uh, health care, these kind of things. Whereas Republicans would define themselves on the with other values of, of uh, being what we call today pro-life or um, and, and not against abortion and, and for the unborn. Um, and also for uh, sexual counterculturalism, where standing for traditional marriage, uh, not going along with all of the agenda of LGBTQ and um, that whole situation that is in our world. And so both of those, and so in the light of this reality, both sides cry out saying they have the corner on the kingdom values and we say, well, I'm for the first two. Other Christians say, well, I'm for the other two. And the parties appeal to Christians saying, you know, what resonates with them. And uh, sometimes, I guess with sincerity, other times I think with a lot of manipulation. And uh, the truth is, here's the truth, is that we should, as believers, resonate with all of them. What should we stand for? All of it. And I say all that to say there's not one po political party of this world that holds all of the kingdom keys. We are believers and we should resonate with them all. We should stand for diversity. We should stand for compassion and caring for people. We should stand for the unborn. We should stand for, for sexually countercultural from the world around us. We should stand for forgiveness. Like this is who we are. We're believers. We're, 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 we're children of the most high God. We're not of this world. So so you say, well, what should I do? How should I vote? See, some people say, well, it's so imperfect. I'm not going to vote at all. I want to say this. You should vote. Please vote. But when you vote, whoever gets elected, we should pray and challenge whoever is elected that they would care for all of the kingdom values, regardless of who gets elected either way. Because if I could say it again, Jesus is the only answer. This is what we're called to be about, biblical Christianity. And not just aligning ourselves with one thing. Say so we are not of this world, we're of the kingdom of God. I'm sure I offended some people with all that one. Here we go, let's go to point three. I'm just glad people are still here in the room. This is great. Number three, we look at the current culture. We look at Jesus, look at the early church. Look at the current culture. Culture is fighting, hating each other. Church, we have to be bigger than the culture around us. We have to be bigger than this election. We have to be bigger than the time that we live in. I like to think like, we gotta think like referees. You know, so you have two teams playing each other and then you got a third team on the field, the referees. The referees are calling fouls on both sides. The referees, after a foul, they come together, they discuss. I've never seen referees yell at each other. <laughs> seen a lot of Christians get upset at each other, right? But how confusing that it would be. They confer, they discuss, and then they call fouls 
on both sides. As, a pe as the people of God, we're saying, yes, I'm going to be involved. Yes, I want to be a part. But here's what I am. I'm part of the kingdom from another world. So what's the greatest way that the world would know who Jesus is? Jesus says this in John chapter 13, verse 35. He says, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. If you vote on the issues, if you post your point on Facebook, if you put a sign in your yard, you stand for whatever is the issue of the day. No, if you love. Can I just stop and just talk a little bit about what we post online? We don't watch it. The world that's watching us as believers will totally lose the influence that we need to be able to share the gospel with them if we don't watch it by the way we treat one another. You gotta be careful in this season not to shame other believers. I've seen people do this on both sides, on both sides. What I'm talking about tonight is on all sides. How could a Christian vote for you? Don't do that. The Bible says there's no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. Who are we to condemn another believer? Don't stir up fights in this season online. Some people love to stir it up. Some people find their identity in division. Some people, they post something controversial, then they go to sleep. And let all of us fight about it all night long. Have a filter in this season. Have a filter. After, if I can be honest, after last week's presidential debate, I watched it. And I was, it, it, I was a little stirred up, if I could just be honest. And I couldn't go to, I couldn't go to sleep. I was focused. I was thinking about it. And I, I wrote, man, I was, I was typing on my phone, writing, you know, I thought the Magna Carta or something like that. I was writing all the thoughts that I had about it and scriptures and all, just all kinds of things, what I just thought about, just all of it. And uh, before I went and posted it, I went in the other room and I showed it to my wife. And she said, hmm. <laughs> and I went to sleep. <laughs> do you do that? Do you let there be a, and it, I could re read you the post. I read it to our staff on Tuesday. I shared this message with our staff and it, there's really nothing controversial. It's essentially what I'm preaching tonight is what I, what I wrote in that post. But I just felt like the Holy Spirit said, don't be in the middle of all the noise and God used my wife to help be the check for me. Do you have anybody where you allow your life, your post to have some type of a filter of another believer or someone who understands we have the opportunity to be a voice of hope in the middle of this, but if we don't watch it, we'll waste that voice of hope on division, and Satan is the only one smiling when we do that. Treat people who vote different than you with respect and dignity. Watch what you say. Watch what you repost. Get some friends you can send something to first. Because if we don't watch it, we'll divide and we'll miss our purpose. And church, this is not just about 2020 election. This is about, I believe, what God's called our church to do collectively. I believe, the, I believe we are in the shallow end of the destiny that God has for City Hills Church. I really believe that. I believe we're gonna see God move from the city to the hills. I believe we're gonna see, uh, we're gonna see people find Jesus all over our region and God's gonna use this church to be part of a revival that we've, that's been prophesied for years here in this part of the country. I really believe that. I'm not just saying that to say it. But you mean to say the only way that that will not happen is if we allow division to stop what God wants to do in our hearts and lives. What you post online is not just about what happens in the 2020 election. What happens online and what happens in personal conversation, what happens in all those things, I believe, is about the calling that God has on our church family. And if we'll allow the Holy Spirit to be a filter for us, if we'll forgive one another, if we'll have conversations instead of posting everything online, I believe God will allow us to be a city shining on a hill that will attract people from every different strata of our society that we can turn to the kingdom of God and they'll see hope and life in Jesus Christ. 
So what do we do? So here's, here's a little bit of uh, voting rubric for, uh, from a kingdom mindset. Because I want to be clear. Vote. Be part of this. What a privilege we have to be part of this as a nation. So here's, here's you say, well, how should I vote? Here's what you do. Number one, evaluate. Evaluate the candidates. Evaluate their ethics. Evaluate their values. Evaluate their attitude. Evaluate their agenda. Uh, discern. Number two, discern. Fast and pray. It would be a great idea for you to take a day between now and November the 3rd to fast and pray and ask God what he would have, who he would have you to vote for. Imagine that. Don't trust every video you see on YouTube about the candidate and about, you know, there's all kinds of, I've seen prophecies saying somebody's, you know, this and another prophecy literally contradicts another prophecy. Pray. You have full access to the Father when you pray. I have full access to God when I pray. Discern. Pray. Don't just do what someone else does. Don't just do what someone pressures you into doing. Don't just do something you see on YouTube. And somebody saw this and said this and put this there and these five numbers and this three and we're on, I'm supposed to do this or else God's not going to love me. No, 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 no. Discern what you are supposed to do. Discuss it. Discuss it with people on, not on Facebook. Praise God. <laughs> uh, and then fourth, decide. Decide. Many of us, I believe, have probably already done this, but decide. And then the last and final one, move on. Don't lose any sleep over it. Church, we have to believe that God is bigger than all this that we're walking through right now. We have to. We have to believe that God raises up leaders. Okay, so even when we're done voting and it's all done and all that, we just got to put it in the category of the sovereignty of God and believe that God raises up some leaders and God takes down other leaders. God raises up and God puts down. And some people say, well, what do you say if someone gets elected and tells us we can't worship God? Well, we're going to worship God anyway. We're going to be the church no matter who is elected or reelected or whatever happens on November the 3rd. We are the church and we are the people of God and nothing that happens in Washington will ever change that. That's who we are. God is bigger than all of us. I want to say this, when all this is over, I'm going to love you just as much as I do right now. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. We as a church are going to keep on moving on. We're going to keep on reaching people. We're going to keep on preaching the gospel. We're going to keep on seeing, like we did Sunday, four people baptized. Praise God. We're going to keep on seeing 21 people in next steps, finding their purpose, getting connected in church. And that's for the what fourth week in a row, 21 people week after week after week in next steps. That means people are getting on the journey and the path of their purpose. Praise God. But we got to make sure we're not just like the culture. We have to be above the culture. So vote. Be part of it. But don't put that above who you are as a believer. Don't, don't associate the two as being the same thing. You're from another kingdom. Here's the fourth thing. Look at what is coming. Now, I don't know who's going to win the election. I don't know if President Trump will be reelected or we'll have a new president. But I know this, there is a day coming where we are going to be with Jesus for eternity. I know that for a fact. I know that's coming. I don't know the day or the hour for that either. I don't know when this life is over for me, but I know this when it is over, I have something coming. And I was thinking about this this week. God describes our life here on earth as a vapor. Just poof. Our eternity will be so much longer than any just little stint that we spent here on earth. And for eternity, we will be with God. So why would we ever lose sleep over just what's happening right here, right now? Because we have something coming that's greater than anything that is of this world. John wrote in Revelation chapter 7, while 
being persecuted while on an island alone, tarred and feathered. The church being persecuted looked like there was no hope, looked like the world was going in the wrong direction. John gets a revelation. He says this, After this I saw a vast crowd, too many to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were all clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from the Lord who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. What was God doing in John's perspective? John, I know it's hard. John, I know it's difficult. But I want you to have a higher perspective because you're going to be part of that group right now that's worshiping before the throne of God. That this world is not your home, John. You're just passing through. Make sure you keep heaven on your mind. Make sure your allegiance stays to Jesus before it's anybody else. Oh, I'm a Paul. I'm a Apollos. No. Is Christ divided? He says, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Was Paul crucified for you? In other words, what I've done for you, Paul was saying, pales in comparison. You can't even compare it with what Jesus has done for you. So don't just put your faith in my hands. Put it in the one who's done so much for you. In the debate last week, both candidates were asked, what have you done for the American people? And they proceeded to share what they had done and accomplishments and why we should vote for them. And I was thinking to conclude this message, what if Jesus stood before us and we were able to ask him, what have you done for our people? Or if I could make it personal, Jesus, what have you done for my life? See, as much as we get fired up about what's happening in politics, can I tell you, neither one of our candidates probably know your name. Or name, know my name. But the king of all the earth knows who you are. And he lifted you up when it looked like there was no way. And when you're tired at night and you can't sleep, you can talk to him. He can heal your body and he can give you peace. And he can give you a purpose. And he can give you a destiny. He knows who you are. He's, he's the one who we should put our hope in and trust in. And he's the one we should go to. Lord, thank you for the nation we live in, what, what would you have me do, God? What would you have our family do? Because you're the one that I'm truly following. This world will pass away, but for eternity I'll be with you, Lord. And so my prayer tonight, church, how do you survive the presidential election? We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. And we've got to stay together. We're about to take communion here in a moment. I saved it. Usually we do it earlier in the first Wednesday service, but I saved it for the end. Because part of the purpose of communion was for the body to be remembered again. Not just to be remembered in the mind, but to actually be remembered, to be the members brought back together. And tonight as we receive communion, whether you're in the room or live online, I want to challenge you to a new commitment to unity. To say, I love my brother. I love my sister. And I'm not going to let this divide me. I'm not going to let the talking points of what the news or what a candidate says divide me from someone I'm going to heaven with. I'm going to be part of the kingdom of God first and foremost. So tonight as we Take this communion. I just pray that God would make us one. That we would be able to walk through this season and every other season as a church when the world tries to divide that we can stand as the shining example of brothers and sisters from every walk of life come together, standing toe-to-toe, eye-to-eye, face-to-face at the foot of the cross of Jesus and being about the kingdom of God above anything else that we see. Let's stand together all over the room today. If you're watching with us online, you get some elements as well to receive communion with us. It doesn't have to be 
grape juice or a cracker. Our kids, we've been doing communion from time to time at home and trying to teach them about who Jesus is. And they always want to know, Dad, what are we, what's communion going to be with tonight? It was elderberry. The other night. We were getting healthy. <laughs> it's not about the thing. It's about what we're doing. It's about remembering who Jesus is. See, this body was broken for our sins, for our healing. It was broken, and also we focus on this every month when we take communion together, but it was also broken so that we could be together. It was dismembered so that we could be brought back together, that this could be a place of unity and strength, a place of hope in the midst of it all. So at this time, let's take the bread to remember the broken body of Jesus. Take the juice. This represents the blood of Jesus. Sacrifice for our sins so that we can have hope and freedom. Let's receive the cup at this time. So Lord, we come before you tonight what I've done the best I know to do in the middle of a very divisive season to lift up your name. And Lord, my prayer is that we would be one, just like you and the Father are one. There would be no division in the church because there's no division in Christ. Lord, that you would miraculously make our church family, City Hills Church, Lord, I can't control what other congregations do. I can't control, Lord, what the world does. I can't control what happens on the news tonight. Lord, but my prayer is that we as a body, as a local body of believers, we would be about your kingdom above anything else. Lord, that we'd vote, we'd be involved, and we would have opinions, all those things, God, but we would submit it all to you. We wouldn't let it divide us, God. Lord, we wouldn't let it cause us to throw away relationships, God, with other believers, God, but we would listen and we would support. We would most of all see that you're above it all and realize that we were put in 2020 on purpose to make a difference in the kingdom of God and that the best is yet to come. And whoever is elected, God, you stay on the throne and we will trust you with our whole lives and our whole hearts, God. Lord, I pray tonight for people that are feeling anxiety about it, people that are worried, people that are full of fear, God, people that are worried, God, about what's happening around us or fearful about what's happening in our society or the coronavirus or all the things that are happening in our nation right now or the injustice in our world, Lord. God, help us to be the solution. God, help us to be the answer. God, but help us be bold for you, Jesus. Help us to lift the banner of Jesus Christ high, God. Help us to lift up your name above every other name, God. Lord, help us to shine your light in this season like never before, God. Use us, Lord, for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.